This is episode 288 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome back to the show. Today, I am doing a solo episode. Andrew Hines here. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, What I'm getting into today is some big news surrounding the podcast and what I'm doing going forward. Uh, So I'm going to break the news to you right now. This is going to be the last podcast episode you're going to hear from me for the indefinite future. So I've uh, I've made the decision and I'm going to be getting into it uh, just momentarily, but I've made the decision based on a number of factors and just kind of responding to the market, what's what's happening. As real estate investors, we pivot and uh, it's time for me to spend some time and uh, dedicate some time and energy and money to a new media venture, a new direction in terms of content I create. And uh, it seems to me that it's time. So let's go ahead. We're going to get right into the uh, the meat and potatoes here. Just before I get into the, the main portion of what I have to say here, um, I want to remind you that uh, I can be reached at andrew at andrew-hines.com. You can also uh, reach me at pretty much any of the social media platforms, but I highly recommend Instagram if you want a more prompt response at the Andrew Hines. Uh, Some of the other ones get by me a little bit. So uh, that's the place to connect with me, if not directly by email. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to staying in touch. But uh, what today's episode is going to focus on is, of course, what I'm up to, updates in the business, uh, updates in all the things I'm working on, and why this is going to be the last podcast for the indefinite future. And uh, just my final thoughts, market, what you should know as a real estate investor, and so on. So let's go ahead and jump right into the episode. All right, so this this is the big episode, the uh, the one that's going to sit on the platforms as most recent episodes for quite some time. So uh, I want to thank you first off for being a loyal listener. I've probably had people that have been listening ever since uh, 2019, and maybe <laughs> maybe they've tuned out for a little bit here and there and come back for just uh, you know a guest that they wanted to see. Uh, but that's that's actually part of the reason that I'm going to be uh, moving on. So I just want to start off by sort of reflecting on the journey. Why did I ever, ever even start the podcast? Well, it all started with Gary V's book. Um, what was the book called? Crushing it. Yes. Crushing it. I, uh, I read that book while I listened to it and it just got me thinking, like I, I actually wanted to eventually be paid to speak. I felt like I always had a bit of a gift for speaking, communicating ideas. Uh, I had some background in teaching and, I knew that I had done some, you know, real estate, but I had kind of lived under a rock. I didn't really talk to people and I wanted to change that. And I wanted to, I wanted to be known because I felt that if I could be known that opportunities would come and I had no idea what that would bring. And so in, in 20, late 2018, I started sharing on Instagram, all the things I was doing and I would get people kind of following, asking questions, asking if they could invest with me. And it was like that, this is when real estate was super popular. Like it was so everybody and their uncle had made money and, and I was getting people asking, you know, can I partner? And I, at the time it was like, no, <laughs> like, that's not what I do. Um, I've, times changed. Like, I think, I think a lot differently now and my, my, uh, horizons have been expanded, but, uh, I, I was speaking with a fellow uh, social media kind of icon guy, and he was he was and not that I was an icon, but he you know he sort of had developed into one. And he he said you know share more, but he's like, why don't you start a podcast? Like all you ever do is talk about real estate, and that's the idea because like we used to just like sit in a hot tub or whatever, like you know friends would come over, we'd end up talking business, life, um, you know economics, all that stuff. So. That was why I started the podcast, uh, because I was just going to take those conversations that I was having anyway and put a microphone in front of myself and whoever I'm talking to. Because I literally, like you go back to those early episodes, that's all the stuff I would just talk to. Like if I was just in a car with somebody going for a drive, hey, what are you up to right now? I would ask them all those questions. And I think the thing that worked really well about this podcast from the beginning, and people loved this podcast at the beginning, because I was talking about burrs on multifamilies, burrs on duplexes, single families, small stuff that anyone could wrap their head around. Well, naturally, as time progresses, um, you know, appetites change. Uh, I think a couple of things happened during this journey. One was I wanted to do bigger things. And I I hit a point where I I needed to talk about bigger uh, concepts, development, 
um, expanding kind of what was possible in my mind and talking to people who were doing bigger things. So I started getting a different type of guest. So I think that's one part of it. But despite that, this podcast grew a crazy amount. We had in the, the biggest month I ever had was May, 2023. Uh, for listeners. And I just on SoundCloud, I showed like 27,000 downloads. And then um, all the Spotify downloads are on top of that. So there would have been probably like another five, six, seven, eight thousand on there. And then there would have been YouTube views. And, and those would have been in the, you know, I'm guessing a few thousand. I, I don't I don't know the YouTube stats too well. They've, they've come down a little bit. But um, that was a big month. And, and I was trending up towards like, if you, if you were to uh, amalgamate all the listens across the different platforms, because I can't track it all in one place, we probably got very close or we're very nearing a million downloads at this point. And uh, I've never actually fully given all the stats, um, but it was up to that point, May, 2023. And people were, were sort of, you know, feeling the pain at that time. It's like things fell off a cliff. Like that summer, I think naturally in the summer, there's a little bit of a, you know, a slowdown because people are going to the cottages, they're taking vacations, they're not listening to podcasts as much. And, um, you know, it, things naturally would have slowed down. But what I noticed is from there, it was a steady decline. And I'd never had that. I was always the 33% a year growth in listenership, always. And uh, I guess it just sort of hit me and, and it kind of sucked the life out of out of this for me a little bit. I always like love connecting with other investors, but just like a little bit of negative sentiment among a lot of investors who had been on the podcast, who didn't want to come back. And it just, it, eventually it got to this point where it used to be so fun. Like I used to edit episodes in bed, sitting next to my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And, you know, I was, I was releasing episodes, multiple episodes a week in the first little while. Uh, cause I'd film an episode, I'd post it, film an episode, I'd post it. And back then it was just like, Sarah Larby had a podcast, Irwin had a podcast and breakthrough real estate had a podcast for real estate podcasts. Those were the three to beat. And I was instantly in the top. I was, uh, you know, in the first few months, I, I was top 10 of all investment podcasts in Canada. And I was consistently ranking up in the top 50 and it felt really good. It was, it was fun. It was exciting. Uh, people really resonated with the content and, um, more recently, of course, I still have people re reach out. Like I've had people like, you know, yell my name in the mall. You know, I'm in a parking lot. I hear Andrew Hines and I'm like, am I being served? Uh, somebody, somebody about to bring some court documents. Um, and it was just people who watch the podcast. Like, it used to be if I was out, somebody would approach me. Oh, I listen to your podcast, like at the gym, at the mall, everywhere. And things changed. And it's not to say that there's anything lost um, by having done that. Like, I'm reminded of what I read in Kevin O'Leary's book, The Cold Hard Truth. And he said, you know, he was asked, why did he, why did he do TV? And he said, because, you know, back in the day, like he would have to really fight to get somebody on the phone. But once he was on TV, anyone would take his call. I sort of had a bit of that effect. And I was really, that was like, I didn't know that was what was going to happen. But I had a feeling when I started that, you know, the connections and the opportunities would open up would be huge. And they, and they were. And uh, the amount of work and money, though, that has gone into this over the years is is crazy. And yes, we did have a sponsor for a bit, Control and Compound. Very grateful uh, for the sponsorship uh, with Darren and uh, helped cover some of the costs. But, you know, my ability to produce episodes and release them with the consistency that we've done, you know, 288 official episodes plus midweek episodes plus B, B episodes, like over 300 uh, released episodes to date. Um, you know, the typically like for, for editing and, and such, like at a minimum I've been at, you know, a thousand to $1,500 a month. Uh, and that's pretty much for the last couple of years before that I was doing it myself and then paying somebody to do like just the bulk of the, uh, the editing. And I was still doing like the final posting and, you know, back then it was several hundred a month, but not, you know, not to get uh, too sidetracked, but I'm just giving you sort of the chronology, how it all went down, what, what I was doing. And, and I was sort of okay with that, a certain amount of spend, because I knew that it opened doors. I, and, and I couldn't directly quantify it, but I knew that one way, one day, it would open doors. And what I found along the way is not only was I spending money, but I was, it was also taking up my focus and it was stopping me from investigating new opportunities, new deals. And I was also still sort of okay with that, but there came this point where I'm like, oh, 
holy crap, how do I ever stop this? Like this has turned into a behemoth. And it sort of was dictating my time. And it got to a point where, you know, I, I guess there is a little bit, there were moments of why am I doing this? And I, of course, love the connections, but there's, you know, you can, you can appreciate what's good about something and then also feel that, that the, what's not great about it maybe is, is a signal. And I, I treated the signal with delegation for some time to, you know, to a cost to myself, but I, um, you know, I, I think it's come to that point now, you know, and, and I, I came to this conclusion, it was probably about two weeks ago when I realized that I had no more episodes in the bank, it's summer, the enthusiasm, like I used to be, I never had to solicit for people to come on the podcast. I would get people pinging me and granted, I will tell you, I still get people pinging me all the time, but they're through booking agents, not people who I, um, typically even respond to because I get too many booking agents just hitting me up because they make commission on it and they're pitching me on some American investor. And I do bring on a few American investors, but it very selectively. And I rarely even look at what these guys send because I just blow up my email inbox constantly. So um, that's kind of how that process worked. I noticed that I wasn't getting like just random people in my network. I'd ask, hey, you want to come on the podcast? And the enthusiasm had changed. Even from, from I'm talking about from, from interviewees, the enthusiasm had changed. And I feel like it's time to win. Like, I don't feel like it's, it's a negative or depressed time in real estate. I feel like the opportunity has never been better. And why do I say that? I say that because the opportunity has never been better. I've never had more wisdom than I have right now. I mean, sure, I could say, damn, I wish I'd done more of this in 2018 or 2015 or whatever. And that can be true. But I've never been more intellectually capable. I've never been more uh, able to respond than I am right now. So... Um, I'm excited about the future. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. I'm going to get to that. Um, the business, like the business in Florida is thriving, um, Grotto Getaway, our, our glamping camp, uh, which we're doing an active equity raise on right now. Um, if you want to know more about that, of course, uh, hit me up. We also did an episode on REI hot seat a few back. Um, I will, I heard them if you could make sure you include that in the show notes here. Uh, just to learn about what our opportunity is, what what it is that we're uh, we're offering. So we're actually speaking with some some uh, larger investors right now who might be uh, you know interested in a bigger portion of this. And um, you know, of course, we are speaking with several others. So we've we've got some funds committed to, um, but we have not yet done a closing. So we're that's where we're at with that right now. Uh, but that camp is crushing right now. We're we're absolutely jammed for August. Um, like the calendar is just looking awesome. It's been looking awesome pretty much since things got warm in July, uh, like full, like the only odd vacant day here and there across 29 active units. So we expanded three units this year. We're going to be expanding more after the, uh, the equity infusion. And that's really what this is about. It's about uh, adding units. It's about adding amenities. And we're going to be able to jack our nightly rate, of course, with some amenities, how much uh, time will tell market will dictate. Um, but I'm pretty optimistic about what's possible. We've been very conservative in our modeling for our investors, but, but I think that there's potential to even go 50% uh, increase in our nightly booking rate with amenities. And uh, there are a number of reasons I think that, uh, but it just depends on how good of a job that we do. So um, yeah, I was sort of talking journey and got a little tangent into what I'm working on uh, and I can expand on that a little bit more. Um, but uh, that's a good segue, uh, just, just getting into the personal updates. So in Florida, uh, we are, uh, Matt, Matt Piché and I are building our business out and we have, you know, 20 some odd deals under contract. We've closed one, uh, we did a double close. So that's when we, we basically buy a property, don't close on it. And then we sell it before we closed on it. And then we do a simultaneous closing the same day. So we sold the property or we bought the property, you know, at 1 PM and at 2 PM we had sold it something like that. I don't know the exact time, but basically we just get the deed recorded from the seller. Uh, we take it and then we sign our own deed and sell it to the, the new buyer. Technically the whole legal package is signed up all at once, but, um, we, we, uh, you know, we just let the title company handle that. So a couple of days before we signed the whole package, he facilitates everything the same day. That one was just a little baby. It was actually our proof of concept. I think we made four grand. It's kind of funny, but that's why it was a double close. Like we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have ever 
um, bought that property and then listed it for sale with that kind of a spread. Um, but that was the first double close we got under contract and we just kind of wanted to prove the concept. So the seller was willing, okay, let's do it. Uh, we've got a bunch of other double closes listed with varying projected profit anywhere from, you know, it could be 30, could be 50, could be a hundred, 150, 200. Uh, but you just never know some of these bigger price properties take longer time to sell. Uh, we do have, so we've closed on a Fort Lauderdale home, 750 we paid. We have that one firm sold with a $50,000 deposit for 975 and we had it sold before we even closed. So we felt really good about that. We had a realtor we were working with. So that one, we probably could have sold for more if we listed it, if we just closed it and listed it, we probably could have maybe just based on the interest we got before we closed, I'm guessing we would have sold it for like a million fifty. But way better for all of us, like Matt, myself, we just, we feel way better having a certain sale. Uh, but if for some reason this fell through, we'd take their $50,000 deposit and then we would just go list it for sale and sell it. Uh, so that's a big win. That's, that's the biggest win we've had yet. We have another deal in the pipeline closing late August that we're buying for like 360 ish. And we've had estimates of up to 700 for the value on that. So that one should be uh, probably our biggest profit to date by that time. Uh, we've got some other, another pre-foreclosure up in the Panhandle of Florida, Pensacola area. You know, uh, basically like buying for 233 and should be able to sell that without even doing anything around 230 or 330. If we did a little light reno, we could get, you know, 350 maybe. But for me, like I really don't want to renovate. So if we can get away with just taking a lot of really good photos and just really documenting a house well as a fixer upper, we sure will. And, um, you know, eventually we might get into some more heavy renos, but for now we still want to stick with a basic flip model and doing minimal, minimal work uh, just to turn things quicker. Um, to me, time is the major factor. Like if I look at IRR, like what, what are our funds being used for internal rate of return and how long they're out? That's what really matters. So if we can turn our money four times in a year, and that's really what we're shooting to do, um, you know, we, we can really maximize our internal rate of return. And uh, that's the idea. So just minimize the amount of time out in the market. So we have another deal, a perfect example of that. We priced it aggressively. So we bought it for 36. It's a piece of land. With closing costs, we were like 38. And we had it sold within like a week or so for 60,000. So that one, you know, it's just a little baby. It'll be about 15,000 in profit. Um, but those are like, we've got a number of deals kind of like that in the pipeline. And the way I look at those is those sort of cover the marketing for a month. Uh, although our marketing spend is about to go up again. But those sort of cover marketing for a month. Um, so, you know, kind of pays the whole engine to run. And then that allows us to keep the big deals when they come. So, you know, we have the small deals sort of paying for the marketing and the big deals are, you know, our sort of home runs. And uh, that's been going good. Really happy with that business. And uh, we're, we're, you know, mulling over. Do we expand uh, just so we can give our, like, I love Florida, but do we expand into another state so that we have time to let our lists breathe? So our cold call lists breathe for an extra month or so before we start calling them again, going right back to the beginning and calling them again. Of course, with the houses, we can keep targeting all day long. There's a number of parameters we can use to target and we're gonna keep doing that, but it's constantly trial and error. Um, we're back up to five cold callers. We, we, we dipped down to four cold callers for a little bit, back up to five. We've got like seven acquisition managers right now. So it's getting interesting. It's very, very interesting. Uh, what Matt and I are acknowledging is we need way more leads for the number of AMs that we have. Uh, so we're adding in more callers. We just started that, that new one today um, or yesterday, and we're going to be starting another two, uh, depending on availability in the next couple of weeks. So going to continue to scale that business and grow it. Uh, feels like a really good partnership overall with Matt and myself. Uh, just the two elements, like Matt's like the fire, you know, push, push, push. Uh, be loud, tell everybody about what we're doing. And I'm, uh, I'm the guy saying, whoa, whoa, let's look at the numbers. <laughs> and I'm just, I say that tongue in cheek because Matt's very analytical too. And uh, we just kind of have that compliment when we work together and, and kind of queuing up ideas, mulling them over and working them through. Um, really good fit. Like I, I, I've long said on this podcast that I like the strategic part partnerships. I don't just like a money partner. Uh, Typically, I, I mean, I still like those, but uh, I really like a strategic partner uh, that makes so so it makes it so that it's more than one plus one equals two. Uh, you know, you can make one plus one equals ten, and uh, I feel like that's the territory we're in. So I'm excited about that. 
All right. I had a note here uh, talking about the market. My thoughts on the market. Canada, the interest rates are down. You know, we're at four and a half percent now on the uh, the bank overnight lending rate. Or sorry, so that's going to be, yeah, it's going to bring our prime down. So if we're at four and a half percent, I don't, I don't know where prime rate's sitting for a lot of people. Some people are prime minus. Some people are prime plus a half. So that'll put them right down to five. Uh, hopefully, if you're on a on a HELOC or something. Uh, every bank, everyone's going to have their own policy with the bank. So uh, don't quote me on that. But, you know, the biggest thing that that changes, and it is it is starting to get more meaningful now that you've got two quarter point decreases, is, of course, the sentiment. Uh, but there's more going on. So now the U.S. is, you know, they're talking about an emergency meeting because the stock market, you know, sort of crash that we've witnessed over the last week or so. And basically the emergency meeting would be to d- drop rates in the U.S. And Canada was really handcuffed. We couldn't drop rates too much more before uh, it really starts to throw the exchange rate out of whack. So now the sentiment obviously should have a little bit of relief on the, the exchange rate, although I kind of like it when the exchange rate is high because um, you know I'm making money in U.S. dollars. So, <laughs> But it drives inflation in Canada to have the exchange rate out of whack. So uh, you know, if, if if we have to buy U.S. goods and our dollar doesn't go as far, naturally prices just go up in the store. It, it hurts regardless. So um, anyway, so where do I think is, uh, things are going? Well, I think that there's a really amazing change for investors. Right now, the people who are just feeling pain are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So some of that negative sentiment actually may be changing. And I, I'm seeing glimmers of it. Uh, a lot of people who were just, you know, hoping and praying, looking, you know, looking for some sign of relief might have just got it and it might have saved some people's butts. And uh, the news, so now Japan, I just learned this, Japan had had a near negative or sorry, a near zero uh, interest rate for a long time and they just increased a quarter point and that like caused chaos in the world because people were borrowing cheap money in the U.S. to invest in the, the American markets or borrowing cheap money in Japan to invest in the American markets. And uh, that's that was been a little bit of that has been a little bit of a catalyst for what's happened. People are also blaming Kamala Harris. Um, I would be very careful with that. I think that's a honeypot because if you blame her, and then all of a sudden the market turns around with some interest rate drops, and then now she is the the uh, the one to thank for the great the great economy. Um, you know, it's a double edged sword. I don't think that that's really that relevant. Um, you know, I don't. I I saw a graph the other day of the economic decline and recovery on Trump's term, and then on uh, on Biden's term, based on number of days in office, and they're nearly identical. So, I don't much think there's actually that much difference. And and there's actually people who argue if Trump were to get into power again, the unpredictability uh, of it would actually not be good for some businesses. And also, uh, they've said. That um, well, obviously Trump being being a nationalist and and being somebody who wants to keep jobs in America, the America first thing, uh, America first policy, will actually cause goods to be more expensive within America, and so that could actually drive inflation. So that is you know some some of the theories being tabled, and I I think that that one does hold some weight. Um, do I think the market would be better with one or the other that's that's hard to say like for instance you could say well there's going to be more war with with kamala because trump had no war in his or no new wars in his term that's very possible you know and if there's more war with her that actually typically stimulates an economy because it stimulates spending so um you know a lot to think about there i'm not too concerned with the politics either which way because i don't think either are good that's just my opinion you know I, i know a lot of people uh you know think that trump getting back in is going to make all the difference in the world um, I personally just don't see that based on what happened last time. Um, I am, I'm very, very much a, uh, there should be a separation between government and me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, appreciate that we have rules and laws and, you know, things to control, uh, what the population does, but I definitely, um, uh, you know, I definitely don't want, uh, government involved in my life. And I, you know, I think we're overly taxed and I think there's a lot of reasons that it's not, it's not great in Canada right now, uh, but hopefully there's the, there's an opportunity for it to be better. But that's a lot of the reason that I'm looking at the U.S. as a future home. You know, I I I, I do see that in my future that I will be relocating at some point, and um, not sure how how soon just yet because uh, we are um, expecting our second 
second son and uh you know being around family is very critical and obviously we want to be around family my family's all over the country but uh jordan's is local and uh you know that's obviously factoring into our decision uh, as to what we do so uh, but you know getting back to the, the, the politics of it um you know, obviously Canada's more left than the U.S. Um, the opportunity down in the U.S. is is certainly um, a lot more conservative leaning, and um, you know they they celebrate business owners, they celebrate entrepreneurs, and that's you know for me that that fits my personality. So my my personality is more conducive to that, and uh, that's why I see that in my future. Um, will I still invest in Canada? Yeah, I'll still have some stuff here, but uh, you know, not residential real estate. That's not in my plan. But certainly the commercial stuff that we're doing, we're excited about it. We know we can grow it and it escapes all the landlord tenant stuff. So um, on the landlord tenant side of things, my long-term outlook is I think there's a day coming and it might be 10 years out where laws become a lot more conducive to landlords. I don't know when that will come, but it will. I'm very confident in that. Uh, but for now, very, very socialist, very, very tenant friendly and very, very repellent of landlords. The market will have to adjust once they see the damage this does um, and, you know, the amount of the exodus of, of landlords. Uh, there probably will be an adjustment eventually, but um, not just yet. So at least that's not what I'm seeing. So let's keep on moving through here. I've got some uh, some more notes here. So what am I currently working on? I've been through that. Uh, we're also working on uh, modeling out our, our Neptune's hideaway um, development play. That's a, and that's a place you can actually stay at right now. It's a cottage resort we have in Tomori, Ontario, not far from our camp. And uh, we're going to be doing an equity raise on that one too for its expansion. Uh, and that one actually may have a crowdfunding uh, element. So that is the plan as of right now. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, But stay tuned for that. And stay tuned. So just so you know, REI Hot Seat will continue. We're going to continue to have weekly episodes. So if you just got to have your Andrew fix, <laughs> I had to say it. If you got to have your Andrew fix for, for the week, I'm still doing that. So one of the reasons that I, I like that show and, and uh, intend to keep doing it is it's a lot more for, for a production sake easy to produce. Uh, we have everybody on the show is in this office. We have a setup here that's going to continue. And, um, and then we're talking about real deals. We're talking about numbers. We're talking about market insights in a very palatable bite size format. Um, usually the episodes are 15 to 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, so we shoot that weekly. It's, it's, it's um, evergreen content. And in, in my opinion, you know, you can use the underwriting skills you learn uh, to, uh, to, work your way through your real estate investing career uh, and obviously you'll add to them but there there's a, the pieces are there and um yeah it's it's been a good fit it's fun it feels different and we have some great conversations i like the the panelist kind of approach to it so it's new and fresh for now we're going to keep going with that and uh you know in, until such time came where where i didn't feel that way then uh then we wouldn't but uh, that gives me an opportunity to still do stuff still be in the eye and then i'm going to talk about what i'm going to get up to other than that but uh Yes, that's so that covers what, uh, what I'm up to. Lessons learned. What did I learn over the years in the prop podcast? Like I learned delegation. I learned how to delegate. I mean, in 2019, I was so handcuffed. I, I was so in a, unable to expand further because of my, my personally self-imposed restrictions that really boiled down to I didn't want to invest in a new city because I didn't want to go through all the, the tedious work it would be to start a new team. I couldn't think big enough. I couldn't delegate big enough and get out of my own head at the time. And I was proud of what I'd accomplished. And I thought things were, were good and they were. I was doing quite well with my investments, uh, but I felt like I was not growing anymore. And part of the reason to do the podcast was to, to reach that network, to reach those other people, get ideas, make connections and grow more. Um, unfortunately, to a degree, my inability to delegate for the first few years stopped me from taking advantage of a lot of opportunities. And, and I got to call it a regret because everything's learning. But, you know, if I had it to do again, I would certainly do things differently. So biggest lesson, delegation. B being an, a business owner versus being a business operator. You don't want to be an operator forever. You, you have to start as an operator. That's how you learn. But if you cannot learn to explain what it is you do, you, you will forever work that job. You'll work till you're dead. And uh, nobody wants that. So anyways, uh, advice for listeners. Yeah, well, one, learn to, learn to delegate. I, I'm just going through my list here. Uh, learn to delegate. Learn, 
learn to adapt to the market and pivot. And that's a big part of what I'm doing right now. I'm pivoting with the content. Uh, and I'm gonna, again, going to get to that in a moment. Uh, so pivot with the times. If, if you used to do duplex conversions, they don't work anymore. You know, understand that, admit that's true, and actually take the first step to doing something different. When I pivoted into Florida in 2021, it was like, I can't sit around forever. I don't think this is where I end, but this is where I'm going to start in my U.S. endeavor because I felt compelled to get some stuff out of, out of Canada. And I think that's a good idea for anybody. That's just my opinion, though. That's not advice. Um, getting some stuff out of, out of Canada is really just diversification. Diversifying politically, uh, you know, economically, there are different economic uh, environments. There's a number of ways that that's a divers diversification. So I think diversification is important. Um, one of the other things and, and an advice I would have for people is don't be restricted by your location. Um, you have to start with what you can manage. If you're an absolute newbie, first off, read the book. Read my book with John Schwanker, Real Estate Titans. Uh, I've got copies just slightly out of reach here. Um, but uh, read that book. We've got an audio book coming out too, if you if you prefer audio format, but that's going to be a few months yet, maybe a couple of months. We're making progress, but it's been slower than, than hoped. Um, I talk a lot about how to calibrate yourself to know what kind of investor you are. And that's very, very important. Being introspective about what kind of investor you are and what your means are, what your capabilities are, you need to know that. So that's one of the first things. Get real about what you can do. Uh, understand yourself, and then the, inv the the appropriate investing strategy will appear. But evaluate the investing opportunities you see against your personal capabilities, wants, and needs. Like, what is it that you you want to do, need to do, and can do? Balance those. Um, you know, like for you, you might be a professional. You might be somebody who works, you know, sixty hours a week, seventy hours a week, and have kids. You have no time to go start an active real estate business. You're you're a passive investor at best. Um, versus somebody who just got out of school, uh, has no debt, still lives with their parents. I mean, you, you can go gung ho apprentice, work for somebody for free, learn the skills you need, go pitch investors to work with you and fund your deals based on what you've learned and your enthusiasm. And you can grow from there. That's the spectrum. Those are the two extreme ends of the spectrum. And then every, everywhere in between, most people fall somewhere in between that. So anyways, know where you are on that spectrum. Probably at the moment, the most important piece of advice I could give. Because too many people start and do things that don't make sense in the bigger picture. I was one of them. You know, I just wanted to start. Um, and if I really, really evaluate, there were better things I could have done at the different times in my life. But hindsight's twenty twenty. So for now, I would just say, be more aware of it and you can make better decisions than I did. You can learn from my mistakes. All right. So future plans and vision. So... Um, my thought for, for content is going to be more of a YouTube uh, approach for now. It's going to be short form, probably 10 to 15 minute videos talking about current events in the market and most importantly, reaching people where they are. So if people aren't looking for a real estate podcast because they didn't hear a story about how their uncle just made $200,000 on a pre-construction sale, um, I need to reach them where they are. And let's face it, a lot of people are in the dumps. A lot of people are, are focused on negative topics. So if I can reach them, uh, you know, talking about politics, economics, you know, just broad topics, uh, you know, because they're concerned about a trend or what have you, and also they just want to understand and then steer them into real estate content. Uh, you know, we've got Aria Hot Seed. I'll still be talking about real estate content, but more purpose-built videos, more specific to the point, uh, purpose-built videos, not interview, not discussion style, um, just monologue kind of thing, uh, talking head news, newscaster kind of stuff. So uh, we'll be doing that. And uh, that's just an experiment. So it, it might be a couple of weeks before that's really up and running, but uh, you can look forward to that. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, you'll get more for there. Um, and then of course, make sure you're subscribed to REI Hot Seat. Communicate with me on uh on my social media platforms and my email. And of course we can stay in touch. I'm looking forward to that. And I will, uh, my hope is I'll be a lot more active in social media in general, not having this on my plate. So take the 20 hours a week that Artem works on this podcast. Uh, well, you know, I mean, some of that's our hot seat. So take say the 13 hours a week that frees up and put that into YouTube content and, uh, yeah, hold me accountable. Reach out to me if you're if you're hoping for more content. Uh, let me know, and of course I'll, I'll value your ideas and, and things that you want uh, want to hear about.
All right. So again, thank you to uh, my audience. Thank you for uh, all your loyalty over the years. And um, thanks to the ones that still graduated. <laughs> you know, I, I talk evergreen content. Evergreen content is what I want because if it's evergreen content, like I can constantly reach people, like people who just want to know what's happening in politics. Well, there's always something new. Uh, what's happening in the economy? Always something new. What's happening with currency? What's, you know, like these topics are evergreen. There are, people are always going to want to know. And there's always an opportunity to get in front of them, you know, talk real estate, bring them into my world. And, you know, to me, I want to make those connections. I want to be known. Uh, that's, that's a big motivation for me because that opens doors. I don't always know, what, know which ones, but it does open doors. And I'm going to keep doing that. I'm not just going to disappear. I'm just, I'm just changing up how I do things. And who knows? I am leaving the door open here. I might go six months and say, ah, screw this. I'm going back to the podcast. I miss it. That might happen. But uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder, they say, and we'll find out uh, if that's what I want to do. But for now, um, changing gears, pivoting, and we'll see what happens in the, uh, the long run. So uh, closing thoughts. It's been a, it's been a good journey. I, I've, I have helped, and this is not uh, me tooting my own horn. I just know it because I have, I have, just from the people who've told me, I've changed hundreds, if not thousands of lives for the better. I know that by helping people create wealth. And this podcast has done that, that my guests have done that. Uh, I've, I have, I'm going to take some credit here because I put it together. I, I, for blood, sweat and tears and money and time and effort, uh, put that together. And to a degree, um, the graduation sucks because <laughs> people don't need me anymore. They come here, they learn, they don't need any, need me anymore. And uh, that's one of the frustrating things about the model. And I, I would be a hypocrite not to acknowledge that what I was doing wasn't perfect and, and had flaws. Because I talk all about how in the past I've, I've fixed those flaws. Um, but of course, you know, we don't all have perfect stories. And uh, I'm very grateful for what this has educated me to do. And I'm very excited for an opportunity to do things differently, do things better and get things fresh again, fresh and new. So, um, yeah, again, thanks. Thanks for everything. Thanks for, for being hopefully one of the people I helped. And I, I've had, you know, thank you to all the people who've reached out to me and said, like, Andrew, like, thanks so much. Your podcast inspired me to buy my first property. And now I've bought eight more. Like I've had people like that on the show, like go back through the episodes. And if you're one of the people who's coming here and you're like, damn, I just started listening and now you're done. This content going right back to episode one can still help you. Uh, if you if you learn the nuts and bolts that I taught through the first 10, 20 episodes uh, and then keep listening to the different episodes in between, you're going to get so much value. You can create uh, you can create your real estate wealth based on the knowledge shared on this podcast. And uh, I want to thank all the people who have come on this show and been, been such a huge part of its success by sharing their stories. And these, these are people who have come into my network, who have become friends, who have become close contacts of mine and... Um, yeah, I just, I wouldn't change that. You know, I really wouldn't. I'm so grateful that I've had this experience and made those contacts and made like literally, literally life changing, um, you know, connections and decisions in my life because of this. And, uh, again, super grateful that I had the opportunity for instance, John and the book, you know, real estate Titans, I can now say best selling author in like so many different categories, all three of the categories we were in for, for real estate on the paperback, uh, it was real estate investing. I don't know the exact categories, but, but we have it all screenshot. Um, and then of course on our, on our Kindle version and, uh, hopefully we'll do it again on the, uh, the audible version, but you know, these are, that wouldn't have happened without the podcast. So, you know, it's really, uh, it's huge. So, uh, one final note is if you're not on my mailing list, that is the absolute best place to be. So uh, the, the best way to get on the mailing list is through my cash flow analyzer. If you just go to my, sh my uh, website, um, they have a cash flow analyzer uh, available there, or you can just go to the tab that says cash flow and enter your info. That gets you onto the list. Make sure you double confirm your opt in. And uh, that way, when I have updates or when I send out the packages for, uh, for the properties that, uh, that we're offering equity raises on, like you'll actually have the ability to, uh, to see that stuff. And, uh, just so you know, like that stuff's going through an exempt market dealer. So there's a qualification, all that stuff. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'm not offering it. It is through an EMD. Um, and, uh, 
yeah, anyways, that's just a quick disclaimer on that. Um, anyways, so yeah, that's it for now. Uh, thank you so much to everybody and, uh, Stay tuned. Stay subscribed to the podcast because occasionally I may throw out an episode that might happen. I just can't promise that right now. I don't really know what the future is going to bring. But for now, the episodes will still remain. You can still use the content that's there. And uh, I will look forward to connecting with so many of you uh, again in the future.